right in their own homes. Mothers are most commonly absent because of migration, but I should state here that children, the majority of Jamaican children, live with their mothers or have lived with their mothers for prolonged periods during their lifetime, with the mother being the main carer in more than 80% of cases. Migration, financial reasons, the fact that the relationship ended, and death are common reasons for parental absence from home. I should also note here that the death of the father is most commonly as a result of violence, while the death of the mother is most commonly as a result of illness. Next slide. So who's caring for our children? When the biological mother is absent, the mother figure is most often the grandmother, particularly when children are under the age of 12 years. The grandmother represents a stable biological figure. When the children get to about 16 years, the aunt and aunt and the sister become the surrogate parents, probably because grandmothers have gotten older and a little more feeble. However, when there are no fathers, the mother's boyfriend or the stepfather becomes the father figure. This can be a very changing person. However, probably less than the absence of, probably less than the nature of the father figure, less important, is the fact that Jamaican children identify no father figure in 8 to 12 percent of cases. How does this structure impact on our children? Children in less stable parental unions or children who are victims of child shifting, having to move from home to home, have withdrawn behavior, delinquent behavior, and aggressive behavior. We have looked at parenting types in Jamaica. Bomrind, a psychiatrist, put forward this picture of parenting types many years ago, and it identifies four types of parenting. There are two categories. There's a responsive, there's a responsive nature of the parent, and there's a demanding nature of the parent. The uninvolved parent is undemanding and unresponsive, pays no attention to the child at all, and makes no demands on the child. The permissive parent makes no demands on the child, but responds somewhat to the child. These are the children who, when they're coming to your home, when their parents are visiting your home, you kind of ask them whether they're bringing their child along with them, because the children have no limits and no guidelines. You know them well. The authoritative parent, which has the best outcomes for children, are those parents who have set reasonable demands for their children, not excessive demands, they set reasonable demands for their children, but they are also responsive to their children's needs. Parenting in Jamaica has been identified as being authoritarian, where high levels of demands are set for children, but parents tend to be largely unresponsive to children's needs. The type of children that are created by this type of parenting are angry, hostile children. It's often associated with harsh levels of punishment. We decided to study parenting in Jamaica a little bit further and looked at what stressors parents thought they were under as a result of parenting. The measure that we used looked at parenting in two ways. Concerns that the parent had about the child and concerns that they had about themselves. In terms of the child, parents reported that their children were not acceptable to them. Parents reported that their children were too demanding. In terms of themselves, they were quick to report that they did not feel competent as parents, that they had no attachment to their child, that parenting was restricting their activities, and that they did not have the support of a spouse. Now, the international literature has looked very much at depression as impacting on children's development. We measure depression in this study, but the stress associated with parenting, with the child concerns and the parent concerns mentioned, were more important in children's outcomes than parental depression. Children of parents with high parenting stress levels have poor mental development, poor academic achievement, and they have more behavior problems. Parents with high parenting stress levels use harsh parenting measures creating more hostile and more angry children. Recent research, however, has shown that parenting information and support 
is associated with reduced parenting stress. If parents are telling us that they're not competent, and parents are also telling us that once they get the information and support, we can reduce their parenting stress, that gives us a very loud message. Health and healthy lifestyles. This is, dis this is divided into mortality or death and morbidity or illness. This slide comes from Carrick, who put up a mortality profile of one to four-year-olds, showing us the change, changing trends in mortality between 1980 and 1995. One looks in, 19, in 1980, one sees respiratory infections, intestinal infections, nutritional problems, and very small representation of um, other infections and parasitic diseases and motor vehicle injuries. The picture has changed in 1995. We see AIDS beginning to emerge as a significant factor in the mortality and death of our children. And we see the infectious diseases decreasing. Next slide. This mortality profile allows persons to identify themselves if they're between 15 to 24 in the left side of the column, and then on the right side of the column to say that if there are no changes in lifestyle, what will happen when they are 25 to 44 years old. The yellow bar represents HIV AIDS. The red bar represents homicide. And the green bar represents suicide. One can see that our health conditions in children are now not largely related to infection, but are largely related to lifestyle. Let us look more closely at what our death what our causes of death are in Jamaica. This supports the point. In one to four year old children, it's HIV AIDS, motor vehicle accidents. Congenital anomalies arise here not because there's new disease, but because as the rate of other conditions fall, it assumes greater importance. HIV AIDS, however, is due to the presence of new disease. When you look at adolescents, 10 to 19 years, homicide, motor vehicle accidents, HIV AIDS, the conditions that we previously referred to as real illnesses, cancer and heart disease, are now, are now fourth and fifth, with the lifestyle conditions most important. <coughs> Let us turn to other aspects of health rather than mortality. Let us now look at morbidity. And I'll start with sexual activity. 20% of children 10 to 18 years have taken part in sexual activity. 27% between 10 and 12 years, and 6 to 7% between 16 and 18 years had sex at least once. Those engaging in sexual activity at a young age are less likely to use contraception. It is no surprise, therefore, that the prevalence of teen pregnancies has been relatively static at 20%, and that there are repeat pregnancies. 12% of young women 15 to 19 years have two to three pregnancies, and 4% do not keep the pregnancy. What happens to our young children? Or, pardon me, what are the risk factors that lead to teen pregnancy? We have poverty appearing again. We have the cycle of the child of a teenage mother, early dating behavior, drug use, <coughs> sexual abuse. Very importantly, lack of connectedness to family, friends, and community. And we have a lack of knowledge of sexuality, reproductive rights, and contraception. Next slide. What happens to our children? The mother has a higher risk of HIV AIDS. In fact, adolescent women have three times the risk of HIV AIDS than their male counterparts. For those who choose to terminate the pregnancy, there are medical complications of abortion, particularly legal abortion. There are psychological complications of both types of abortion. Young, um, young adolescents have reduced educational and working potential because of pregnancy. They tend not to seek health care and to engage in more high-risk behavior. They tend to have further pregnancies, and when they do form relationships, they have significant relationship difficulties. The child has poorer health and has poorer school performance. Well, in the recent parenting study, interestingly, 25% of parents of 10 to 18 year olds 
said they were unable to discuss sexual activity with their children. And only 50% felt competent to discuss sexual issues. Luckily, there is sex education at school. For urban Jamaican 16-year-olds, 80% of children reported that they learned sex education in classes at school because parents are feeling incompetent at having these discussions with children. However, 60% are learning from their friends, almost the same as are learning from school. 40% from their mothers and 20% from their fathers. Next slide. But let's see where they really learn about sex. When they watch television, there are 14,000 sexual incidents per year. These figures are from the United States. We, we do not have comparative figures for Jamaica, but as we watch so much cable television, I suspect they are very similar. Of these 14,000 sexual incidents, 170 or 1% discuss abstinence, birth control, sexually transmitted diseases, or pregnancy. One third of family programs make sexual references. Soap operas show extramarital sex eight times more than sex within marriages. I hear everybody murmuring, everybody knows this, right? 53% of girls and 27% of boys in Jamaica at the age of 11 to 12 years watch soap operas regularly. The message here to parents is that if you don't talk to your children, somebody else will. The concerns of HIV AIDS in terms of mortality were mentioned earlier, but I would also like to heighten the concerns of children with morbidity. Children are largely infected by perinatal transmission from mother to child, but probably the larger proportion of children are affected without being infected. They are affected economically by the illness and the death of their parents, and if you remember, the loss of parental earnings contribute significantly to poverty in a household. They're also affected because they have to care for parents and siblings. They're further affected by stigma, discrimination, and marginalization. Our children learn very early about discrimination. Next slide. We have been able to make inroads into the proportion of AIDS cases, both male and female, and this has been due to the hard work of the health services and public education. Next slide. But we haven't made inroads with regards to stigma and discrimination. The child in this story did not even have AIDS. Her picture was used in a newspaper article. Next slide. Let's look now about children's other aspects of children's health. Obesity, nutrition, and exercise. Obesity is now more common among Jamaican children than under nutrition. That's because we have changed our lifestyle. We now have high fat and high fat and sugar and low fiber diets, the type typically found at fast food stores, and a sedentary lifestyle, computers, video games, videos, TV. The impact is that we are seeing chronic diseases in childhood much more early than we would previously see them. And we are also now seeing an increase in chronic disease in adulthood. The intervention that has been proven is that healthy lifestyles need to be encouraged from an early age in those first few years of life. Taking children to fast food places as, as um, for homework, for doing homework and for coming first in class is actually not doing them too much good. I want to also address the important aspect of mental health and this will arise again later on. Mental health disorders are set to become the leading cause of disability by the year 2020 if we continue the way we are. They currently account for one third of years lost to disability. Child mental health disorders are considered to be of increasing importance because we now know that antisocial, aggressive and violent behaviors do not first begin at 16 or at 20 or at 25. They have their beginnings in childhood with the difficult child to manage that does not get the attention that he or she needs. The most common conditions that we see in children under the age of 10 years are the attention deficit disorder, learning disorders, child abuse, adjustment disorders, and the adjustment disorders are commonly children having to adjust to changing parental relationships 
or to loss of family members through migration or through death. The disruptive disorders, these are the oppositional defiant disorders, the conduct disorders.